Welcome, everybody, to uh, another Live with Kevin. Uh, we're going to go live in a few minutes to to record another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Some of you might have been with me just a few minutes ago. Kevin was like here uh, doing another episode. And um, so I'm glad to be back with you all. Here's the thing. If you're joining me uh, for the 50th time or the first time, uh, just say hello. Tell us where you're from. We'd love to know that. Um, and um, just enjoy the conversation. Feel free to ask any questions that you have along the way. I've had the chance to spend the last 10 minutes uh, with our guest. You're going to love her. You're going to love the things we're going to talk about. So with that, uh, welcome. And uh, we're going to officially start the podcast, which means we'll edit it after three, two, one. Welcome to another leadership. Let me, let me do that again, everybody. Three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Let me ask you some questions. You know that communication matters. I mean, we all know that, right? And we know that communication is important to our relationships, whether they are personal or professional, especially at work. And we all know that, right? And we know that the world has changed. And so communication has gotten more complex than ever, right? So what can we do given all of that? As it turns out, there's a lot we can do. And uh, so in this episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, I'm going to introduce you to a guest to help us work through some of those things, to help us what she calls bridging the gap. But before we introduce her, uh, while you're here, I hope that you'll imagine that you're joining us for a cup of coffee. Just share your questions, your comments, and your ideas, because they will make for a better conversation and eventually a better podcast episode. Now, if you aren't here live and you're listening to this uh, during the podcast, on the podcast, you could be here live in the future. You can get all future live episodes and therefore interact with us in this way and see them much sooner. In this case, about four months sooner by joining our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn and you can join us and get on board with that. Today's episode is brought to you by the Remarkable Leadership Masterclasses excuse me, Remarkable Masterclasses each month. A masterclass is designed to help you become the remarkable leader and human you were born to be. Details on how to get on board for a specific skill or to get discounts in the future can be found at remarkablemasterclass.com. And with all of that out of the way, let me bring in my guest. There she is. And let me introduce Katie McCleary. And then we will dive in to bridge the gap, right? Katie McCleary is an entrepreneur and storyteller who trains leaders, creatives, and humanitarians to launch their big ideas by leveraging their social and cultural capital. She is the founder of 916 Inc., a nonprofit that has transformed over 4,000 vulnerable youth into confident authors. She is the host of The Drive podcast on NPR's CAP Radio with American Leadership Forum NV in Sacramento, where she lives. She is the co-author of a brand new book with Jennifer Edwards called Bridge the Gap. Breakthrough Communication Tools to Transform Work Relationships from Challenging to Collaborative. Katie, welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having me, Kevin. I love your energy. We all could all use a dose of this on Monday morning in the West Coast. <laughs> well, so apparently there's someone in Iowa. We do not know if they need energy now. And uh, we'll, we'll get a hello from Vincene as well. We're so glad that you're here and everyone else that's joining us, whether it's live or later. We're so glad that you all are here. So, so Katie, I've been looking forward to this conversation, um, and there's a lot of directions we could take. It's always a little bit more challenging for me when I have a, a guest who's an expert on the other side of the mic. I feel like I hope I have to do an extra specially good job because you're also a podcaster as well. So uh, let's start by, you didn't wake up when you were six and say, I think I'm going to start a not-for-profit. I think I'm going to do a host a podcast. Like, so tell us a little bit about the journey that leads you from Minnesota to Idaho to Sacramento. Yeah, absolutely. So our backstories really matter, right? Our lived experiences. And I have been obsessed with authors my entire life. I mean, I am a book nerd through and through. I love language. And I am about that, Kevin, because I grew up pretty lonely. I grew up to two wonderful parents, um, and we were the working poor, and we traveled a lot 
for work until we found our place. And books were always my friend. And so I've grown up really wanting to understand people and understand authors and how they like witness the world and do amazing things. Awesome. And that led you to this. And so now you're not just a book nerd who loves books, but you've written one uh, with Jennifer Edwards. And so tell us about uh, what led you to do this? What led you to write this book? This story is so fascinating. So I was writing a book called The Metamorphosis about Franz Kafka, but for um, young millennial entrepreneurs who wanted to transform themselves into becoming these great, amazing people. At the same time, Jennifer was writing a book about how to have better, meaningful conversations um, in your business and your work life. We met in a women's leadership circle and man, we could not be more different, Kevin. Two different walks of life, two different political beliefs, spiritual beliefs, and we loved each other. And it was like, wow, I'm so attached to this other human. And we decided- so Can to I stop you? I got to stop you right there. Yes. And like, I have to say that the fact that we are not alike shouldn't preclude us from that. Like that should be the norm. And as opposed to being this, you know, oh, that's cool. Like that really ought to be the norm. We don't have to be alike. Uh, yeah. To love We're other, stronger so. together yeah. because we leverage like our strengths and assets together as well. And when we come across these ways in which we don't understand, right? Why do you think that way? Why do you operate that way? Why are you working that way? Instead of asking why, it's tell me about. I'm curious because I love you and you're very successful. How are you doing it? And so um, we actually put aside our individual books and we merged our curriculum and it was like magic. And we did it in a time which our nation was going through great deep division and pain. And um, then we started kind of merging clients, working together. And here we are now about three and a half, four years later. So you've written a book together. You've built, you're building a business together across the country from each other and all those, those other things. And so you told us a little bit about what the two original book ideas were. Um, tell us, I mean, I know, but no one else knows. What's the big idea of this book, Bridge the Gap? The big idea about Bridge the Gap is that we all struggle to understand like and accept some people in our lives and vice versa. People struggle to understand like and respect us especially in this new age. So instead of being caught in what we call a finger trap, you know, those little old, those old toys, right? Where you put your fingers in and then you want to get out and you struggle. The key is to move closer in. And so when we're in these relationships where we struggle to understand, like, and respect, how can we get curious? How can we own how we're showing up? And what are the shifts that we can make in our communication strategies to move closer to the other person so that we can really meet the needs of understanding, liking, respecting, and accepting some people and move forward in a collaborative way. Now, so now what I'm going to, I'm going to throw something on top of that. I know that you uh, believe this because it's in the book. Uh, and that is that notice what Katie just said, everybody, is that uh, it's not about the other person. It's about taking responsibility for this ourselves. And, and so I want you to really listen to the rest of this conversation and think about the ideas that Katie's going to share with you through that lens, that this is about what, not like, not that, how do, how do I do something to that other person? But what do I do here inside so that I, and what are the strategies that I can apply? So the subtitle of this book is it uses the words communication tools, but it's not like finding th something to replace zoom or the telephone uh it's the tools that we need to apply ourselves every day yes no add to yep. that yep absolutely it's transformative leadership it's inside out leadership it's understanding how am i showing up what is the language that i'm using what is my energy throughout right how do i better connect to that person because we are long gone from the days of convincing cajoling and forcing people into collaboration in our way of thinking. Change forcing to complying. And then you've got your three C's. How about that? Um, oh You're so smart, Kevin. That was amazing. <laughs> Everybody who knows me knows that I love alliteration. So uh, I immediately thought of the third one. So uh, we talk all the time in our leadership work, Katie, about uh, the, 
as a leader, what do you want from people? Do you want them to comply or do you want them to commit? And everyone knows which one they want. It requires a different set of tools for us and mindsets for us to use to move toward commitment as opposed to settling for compliance, right? Um, so in the book, uh, Katie and Jennifer introduce us to someone that we all need to know. And her name is Amy. So introduce us to Amy. Uh, I, I love the way you guys did this. So uh, so uh, introduce us to Amy. Okay. So Amy is your frenemy. And she's right on your shoulder all the time. And Amy is scanning your environment constantly to see, are you under a threat? And that could be a real threat, like a gun to your head, right? Or an earthquake or a car accident. Amy is also scanning for perceived threats in your environment. Am I nervous? Am I awkward? Will I be shamed? Is somebody going to blame me? What is this conversation going to be like? So Amy is short for the amygdala, which is that tiny little thumb-sized gland that we all have in the back of our brain. And we have personified the amygdala, which is responsible for your flight, fight, flee behavior that you might engage in consciously or unconsciously whenever you're no, no, in a no. Not that you might, that you do, right? You do. It's true. You do it. <laughs> People love to believe they have immense control over this. You can with lots of self-awareness and tools, but Amy is always riding shotgun with you. And so we have to understand when I'm feeling reactive, defensive, angry, am I in charge or is Amy in charge? And how do I quell Amy? Because she ain't going to ever leave. You are zipped into a human suit for life. How do I work with Amy to better get to the results that I'm looking to achieve? So as you're saying this, I'm thinking this is a television show here, right? There should be a television show about, you know, named Katie and Amy. And, and you could be the star of the show and we could have Amy always with you. I'm just saying, just tossing that out because you don't have anything else to do. Because you're really no. not busy running a business or promoting a book or anything like that, Katie. <laughs> nothing like that at all. So, um, you know, then you really take us into some tools. And and, and I'm just going to dip in and pull some things out. And when we're done, if you've got something else that you feel led to share that I didn't talk about that you'd like to talk about, we can do that. Um, but you talk, you know, there. if we're going to talk about communication tools, we know that listening is going to show up. Uh, and, and I've read, and you have to 50 books that talk about listening. You, you do some things here that I think are a very clever way to get us to think about it. And, and you frame the goal differently than I've ever heard it framed. You say that the goal is to have clean and curious listening. Now people have probably said, yeah, I get the curious part. What do you mean by clean? So talk about what you mean here as the goal of listening. If we're really going to be able to bridge the gap with other people. Uh, talk about what you mean here. Yeah. So we're all, um, we're all uh, victims and perpetrators of sloppy listening. Am I distracted? Am I not present? Am I thinking about something else? Am I just waiting my turn to speak? Right. We're all guilty of all these different ways. We want to get to clean listening. So most people are familiar with the phrase clean eating. It's a conscious choice that we make, right. To put healthy clean foods into our body so that we can perform optimally. Now, what if we take that same concept and we apply it to our ears, right? Our ears and our brain are filtering noise, distraction, a million things all the time. How do I arrive to be clean in my listening so that it's not tainted by all the stuff I'm trying to manage internally and externally? And that is a conscious choice to show up present and spacious in your mind in order to truly hear what the other is trying to speak into you. Okay. So two things, first of all, you know, a lot of us are familiar with clean eating. Doesn't mean we do it. Right. Uh, but here's the thing. And, and a lot of us are familiar. Well, we've never heard the idea of clean listening. We know how to do it. I, I often tell people, you, you know, how I could prove to you that you can. So there's not really, it's not really a skill problem. It's a habit problem. Right. Yes. And, and so, um, so talk to me about th the second thing I want to take from this is this idea that you said about keeping our minds spacious. What do you mean by that? Well, we have a lot of junk and noise happening in our lives, right? We have a million mile long to do lists. We are distracted. We live in the pressure cooker. 
We need as humans to find respite, to find space in our brain so that we can take a pause and take a moment so that we can really show up present and optimal to our lives, but also with other people. And when all that junk is in there chattering and making you feel and all this stuff, how do we stop it? How do we, to, I guess, uh, quote Susan Powder from uh, 80s fitness fame and diet fame, stop the insanity, stop the insanity. How do we get to a spacious place? Because that's what it means to receive another person, to hear them and to connect them so that they can empty their cup. And, and really that's on us to show up, to receive the other spaciously. I want to talk about emptying the cup again in a few minutes. Uh... But I, I just had another observation or insight, I think, as you were talking just there. And that is that, you know, I've sat in this chair using either this this microphone and either this camera or one not quite as fancy uh, hundreds of times in the last couple of years and asked people, what are they missing the most uh, in this new world of work, virtual, distance, remote, hybrid, whatever you want to call it. And almost always on that list is connection. And almost always at the top of the list is connection. And the interesting thing about what you just said is that we all want that connection. And you just gave us one of the keys to getting it. And it's our choice to filter out. All that other stuff doesn't matter as much as that connection, in this case for me, with you right here. And the more that I can do that, that's my part of this, right? I, I can work to build the connection right there. You want to comment add to that? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, we live in a really fast paced time, time bound world. And I think that true connection happens when we say, okay, I have this, this amount of time and then I let it all go. You have to let the external go and true connection happens in that magic in those moments when you're with people that are kind of silent actually. Um, and we don't prize silence. We prize movement and talk and action and forward, where if we actually just take breath and take spaciousness, man, our, our conversations are better and our energies just sort of align better. And I know that sounds woo-woo energies. Well, you are in California. I'm just saying. I am in California. Yeah. <laughs> but I also grew up super working class and, you know, um, and uh, that is where true connection happens. It's not, it's not about swapping war stories. It's about listening and being with, that's it. Just be with people. Yeah. You know, I mentioned at the top that I had just finished another uh, earlier, uh, another podcast episode. And in that episode, we were talking about listening without ego, uh, a sort of a different context for the conversation. For all of you listening to the podcast, you can go back and listen to David Bodanis's conversation with me. Uh, but we were talking about listening without ego, and I'm hearing you say the same thing. If we're sharing war stories, it feels like, whether we mean it or not, it feels like, well, you told one, so now I'm going to tell a better one, right? Like I, one of the things I've learned in my life, Katie, is if someone tells me a story about air travel that's a bad story, it is not in my best interest to tell one of mine. I'll tell you why. Because I got worse ones. <laughs> and even if my intention is only to empathize, the risk is it comes off as something entirely different than that. And, and so that happens to be the one place in my life I figured that out. There's 763 more I haven't figured out. Uh, <laughs> but your point is about just being silent and, and, and taking that in and, and feeling what they're feeling is going to change the moment, but it's going to change the relationship, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. How many times are we in a leapfrog conversation? Let me show you how I matter. Let me show you how I exist. Let me show you how I do it, right? Rather than just being with someone, we think there's great power in counting to eight seconds in your brain. Eight full seconds after someone shares a story. It feels like a lifetime for many people. Eight seconds is a processing space and time that actually shows that you listened and that you're just feeling it. And then you offer something very simple back. Thank you for sharing that with me. That is it. That is connection. Yeah, eight seconds is a long time, everybody. Um, yes. You know, uh, yeah, that's really good. That's really good. Um, we, we're moving from, 
from listening to conversations and you really can't separate them. Of course you have to, you have to separate them if you're writing a book because it can't all get just pushed together, smushed together, if you will. So you also use that word curious. It's actually one of the key ideas of the book is being curious, but uh, you, you, you talk about curious conversations. And one of the things you said, you mentioned this phrase earlier. I want to loop back to that. I want you to talk about the human cup. You said, let them empty their cup. What do you mean by this? Yeah. So somehow along the way, we kind of all got taught not to really have like small talk anymore. And I don't know if small talk is maybe the right word, but when you're with someone, right, like they need to express maybe what's just happened. They have a very, very full cup. Okay. And this is, this is your day, your to-do list, everything that's on your mind. And I just need usually about three minutes, five minutes to empty some of that out because then that will give a margin for us to collaborate together, for us to be together. If you have a full overflowing cup, it's just too much. It's just too much. So when you're with people, give them that grace, focus your energy and attention on them. And we love this phrase to start all conversations. Tell me about. And it doesn't have to be soft and sappy. If you're in a commercial space or a business space, tell me what's going on with your team. Tell me what's going on with your sales numbers. Tell me what's going on in your community, right? Let them bring what's up top of mind to empty that cup and just keep following them. Don't contribute back. Just keep following. Tell me more about that. What about that, right? What else? Yeah, exactly. Whew. They get to a place where they have margin for us to say, hey, what kind of cool things can we do together? How can I help you? Where might we lead forward? Yeah, as a leader, a lot of times um, we find that people come to us and they want, the word we use is they want to vent. Really what they're doing is emptying their cup. And if we try to go on with whatever the task is and not give them that chance to, I mean, I'm, all I'm really saying Katie is what you're saying in a different way to maybe connect to someone or, or to notice the time that, you know, what you're saying is we should be, can be, can choose to be proactive and give people the chance to do that. If we don't do that, or if their cup is so full when they walk in, mm -hmm. in person or virtually and start venting, that's what they're doing is they're emptying that cup a little bit. And, 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 and you know, we've got to, we've got to let that happen. We got to be okay with that. And the best way to do that is to just say nothing to your point. Right. Yeah. It's Amy again. It goes back to Amy, right? When we allow others to empty their cup, we're releasing the pressure valve for them. That's a choice we're doing in service. And it relaxes Amy to say, ah, oh, I'm safe. I don't need to be defensive. I don't need to be compliant. I mean, it's all those kind of words, like I can just be myself for a moment. And that's really where the magic happens. And again, if we're, we'll get to sort of everything we're saying applies for us as peers and as friends and as, you know, spouses or whatever, parents, whatever. But certainly as a leader, uh, these things uh, apply to us as well. And, you know, I think that the more that we're able to do this as a leader, the more that we have the chance to build the relationship. You mm -hmm. said it earlier, understand, like, respect mm -hmm. with that other person, you know, mm -hmm. even if there's a, even if there's a power differential between us, right? Absolutely. Anything more, more you want to say there? No, I really believe that, you know, again, if you're the leader, you're the channel, right? How you show up critically matters. And that role modeling, that giving of grace and space and the language I use, it transfers. It's very magnetic. So another thing that you talk about that I really like is this idea of listening for energy words. And this relates to, to continue to have more powerful conversations or curious conversations. What do you mean by this and how do we do it? Yeah. So when we're in a conversation with someone and we're choosing to have what I, what we call a one-way conversation, right? No leapfrogging. <clears throat> so I say, all right, you know, um, Kevin, tell me about what's happening in your work these days, right? So Kevin, you may tell me some stories, right? And there might be a word in there. And usually that word is a value-based word, right? Freedom, family, time. It might be a word that describes feelings, right? 
When you find that word, tell me more about that. What does that mean to you? So in our book, we give an example of two managers who are kind of not getting along. So one of them goes and has a curious conversation with the other and keeps hearing the word family come up about, well, in my family, it's this. In my family, it's that. And she's like, well, we don't use that language in our culture, in our corporation. Tell me about family. And it turns out that for this particular manager in his family growing up, he always got stuck doing the chores and all the stuff that wasn't fun. And he didn't want to get labeled that when it came to getting together their checklist, their to-do list, and recreating a training manual. So by positioning it and understanding his language that he's giving a lot of energy to, it unlocks you somehow to say, oh, now I understand. Now I understand. That's what I mean by energy words. So, you know, you, you wrote this book. It came out um, in it, as this pandemic is winding down. Mm-hmm. And the, the principles that, that you and Jennifer have written about and that you and I have been talking about are universal and evergreen for sure. And yet more of us are doing more of this work this work of communicating, this work of bridging the gap. We're doing more of it virtually. So what is your thought? What are your thoughts about doing this? What are the differences in doing it virtually? We sometimes call it the long distance difference, but what is it that your, what advice would you give to layer on top of what we've been talking about if we're going to be interacting with people virtually? I think the number one takeaway is that I think we're in a virtual hybrid environment for a very, very long time going forward. So communication takes extra work, right? All those things that transfer when we're in person don't transfer as easily as they do online. So I'm even seeing it in our interaction, Kevin, right? Like you and I have committed to bringing forth a lot of great energy for us to have a really vibrant conversation. Like that's a choice to make because I know that it would happen naturally if we were across the table from one another. But um, it's about taking a pause in our day to say, how am I going to show up before I turn on that Zoom screen button or whatever digital platform that sure. it is, right? Um, and it's about lessening distractions. We're very distracted in the virtual environment. We have notifications. We're looking at our face. We're seeing backgrounds. We're hearing noises, right? It's, it's just our brain is splitting all the time. So it just takes a lot more effort to really communicate clearly. And we all know this adage, to be clear is to be kind. And it'll help. 100%. That is 100% true. There's, um, there, you mentioned it earlier. And, you know, we had had some, there was some chance I thought, and I was kind of hopeful, I've not done it very often that I have both you and Jennifer here. And of course it didn't work and that's fine. Uh, I, I get more Katie time. That's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, you, you talk about something late in the book uh, about the two of you. You mentioned earlier that you, you couldn't be more different in some ways, in some, mm-hmm. in some, sort, of, in some sort of obvious-ish ways. Um, and, and yet there, there's, there's a big, I think, lesson about what you, the two of you learned um, that relates to the book, so to the ideas we've been talking about. So what are your lessons that you learned or are learning. Yeah. So Jennifer is conservative. I'm liberal. Jennifer is a Christian. I'm a Buddhist. Jennifer um, is upper class. I'm actually a little bit more middle class. Um, And we both have different talents and strengths in so many different ways, but they're amplified within each of us differently. And so it's really easy, right? When you're with somebody who thinks different than you, behaves different than you, speaks different than you, uses different language, like has a whole world about them, right? And so one of the most powerful lessons that we've learned is to return to curiosity. The minute that there's a miscommunication, a breakdown, a misunderstanding, right? Or something just feels off, we within 12 hours go to one another and say, hey, I'm curious about what happened here. I'm curious about what it meant for you. Can you please tell me about that? And man, is it a lifesaver in not being hijacked by stories that we can tell ourselves, right? 
internally about what happened or overthink it or stress out, right? And so I think this idea of return to curiosity could be extended in our families, at work, in community. The minute that you feel hijacked by, uh, what just happened, right? Return to curiosity. Something did happen, but let's go be curious about it before we manufacture stories that could do real damage. In my experience, almost all of the damage happens in our own heads. Um, I mean, sometimes someone does something and there really is malintent. I'm not saying that that's not true, but it's far less often than we tend to think. Again, Amy, right? Hello. Uh, But I, I love that return to curiosity with the other person is really what you're saying. But Mm -hmm. I think return to curiosity with ourselves as well. Like what, what am I manufacturing here? Like what, uh, one of the ways I do this, Katie is, and I do this in coaching all the time. People people say, well, someone, someone, so did this. Okay. Like, why did they do it? Well, here's why. Like, do you know why let's, what are the other possible reasons? I don't know what the reason is. You're not going to know what the reason is. Let's come up with seven possible reasons. And the minute I know there are seven, I'm much less convinced that the one I thought it is yep. is real. So it's it's a way, it's it's I didn't realize this till right now, but it's it's being curious enough internally to say, okay, now because eventually I want to have that conversation with the person to your point. But sometimes I need to just step back myself because I might physician heal thyself, right? Uh, yeah. a little bit on the front end of that. Um before we wrap up, and we do, unfortunately, eventually have to wrap up, Katie, um, what, what, what are some, what, I think this has really been a, a conversation that applies to us in all parts of our lives, as we've already said. Um, are there any specific lessons either that, we, that you want to reinforce or add uh, for in, either individuals or for us as, in our, with our leadership hat on? Yeah, I think um, one of the things I'm most proud about this book is that we wrote it for the everyday working professional. And we really believe that everybody is capable of leadership. Everybody is capable to step up and become that leader in the relationship to like release you out of the finger trap, right? And so there's just small shifts that we can make, like replacing and over the word but, right? Two things can be true at the same time, but creates a competitive conversation between people. And too often we're in a competitive conversation. It's it's unconscious. So let's bring some transparency to that and be conscious to use and. So anybody can do this work. It does take a special fortitude to look in the mirror, to say, how am I showing up? Right? How can I be more curious? And how can I be in service to another person to allow them to empty their cup? Um, that's really good. I really like that a lot. And you've said this several times and I didn't comment and I'm going to now you, you've said it several times being in service to others. You want to say any more about that before we move on? I think that's really what true collaboration is. Collaboration is not my idea versus your idea. And then we smushed it together. Collaboration is in service of a higher idea um, that then you can't trace to any one particular person. And so we do that first by being in service to other people to hear what their whole world is about. Everybody is a whole world unto themselves. And too often we're just so selfish and stuck in our own world. So go travel to the other side and hear what's possible. All right. I've got a couple of questions unrelated. Before we wrap up, I want to go back to you uh, and no longer talk about the book. Here's the question. What do you do for fun, Katie? Oh my gosh. I hang out with chickens. I have 16 chickens and um, they're all hens and I can identify them. Like you could hand me an egg and I could tell you which one of my girls laid that egg. I talk to them um, and I hang out with them. I love chickens. All right. What do you do with all the eggs? Um, I give them to my neighbors and my community and we eat about two dozen a week. There you go. Uh, So the only thing I told you I was going to ask you is this question. What are you reading these days? So I am always reading three books. Um, I'm a book nerd and I'm loving the dictionary of obscure sorrows by John Koenig, which is a new lexicon of language to give, um, words to those feelings that we have, that we just don't know that we have love that one. And I'm also reading sapiens, which is a brief history of mankind by Yuval Noah Harari. And I just, 
I really love thinking about who we are as people, who we are as creatures, and why we behave the way that we do. All right, that's two. Was there three? Um, the other one I'm reading is an older book by Diane Ackerman about um, whales, bats, and crocodiles. It's called by moon by the whale by moonlight. The whale. No, sorry, it's the moon by whale light. The by Diane Ackerman. By whale light. Yeah. All right. See, these are the things you can only get here. Uh, on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, everybody. <laughs> Just saying, uh, thank you for sharing <laughs> all of that with us. Um, you know, it's interesting to me, and I'll, I'll share this with you. It, it may not surprise you, Kate, Katie, but um, it's, it's. I would bet that a third of my guests, approaching a third of my guests will say, well, I, I'm always reading multiple books. And, and they're often saying, I'm often reading three. So you're, so I, it's, I don't know. There's, there's something yeah. there. Um, and just interesting. Uh, so now uh, the question you've been really wanting me to ask is where, where do we can learn more about your work? Where can we find out about the book? Like point us, where do you want to point us? How do people connect with you, Katie? It's easy. How to bridge the gap.com. How, How to bridge, to the, bridge gap. the gap.com. Okay. Yep. The books are being sold everywhere. I prefer to buy from independent bookstores um, like Indie Thrift or Powell's, um, but it is sold everywhere. And um, we would love to have a conversation with you. That's what we're all about. How to bridge the gap.com, everybody. And now a question for all of you before we finish. And the question that I ask you every single week is now what? What action are you going to take as a result of this? How are you going to be more curious in general? How are you going to have uh, practice and choose more clean listening? How are you going to work to build understanding, respect, like, and respect with others? There, there's a hundred things. Well, maybe not a hundred. There's a bunch of things that I wrote down in my notes. And, and the most important thing that you can do as a result of being here is take some action. And when you do, when you make that choice to be more personally responsible for your communications and your results, whether they are with people across the cubicle or across the country, um, better results will, will arise for everyone. So Katie, thank you so much for being here. It was such a pleasure to have you. Thank you. I love your energy. Come up to California, Kevin. We'll do great stuff together. Well, I lived there once before and listen, we don't have to live in the same place to do great no. stuff together. So we can continue that conversation, but for all of you, you know, we're going to be back in next, next week. So, and if you love this, you'll love the next one. And if you love this, so will a friend. So invite a friend to join you to listen in the future or just, and you say, well, they all use a different po podcast platform. Just tell them, go to remarkablepodcast.com and check us out. And we'll be back here next week. I hope you will be too, right here on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast.